We serve a God who created this universe in an orderly manner, and we ought to be able to study His creation in that way. And uh, it set them up to make huge discoveries that we still talk about and we still teach. The process of going through, uh, especially graduate school, was really trying on my faith. The constant message I heard was uh, that you evolved, uh, that all life evolved, that there is no design. Uh, I had one teacher openly mock uh, the idea that life was designed, openly mock the idea that enzymes were designed. Just go back in, in the history book or open up pretty much any science textbook and you start you know, reading the names of the people that discovered some of the biggest things that are still underlying our understanding of science today. And they did it out of a place of faith. Written in historical records, documented in Tacitus and Josephus For those who don't believe us Check the marks of architecture written on a fetus Neural nets and network correcting codes complete us They are theory Theory So how does belief in God unlock scientific discovery? Wow, that's a big question um, And I have to look at it through the lens of my experience and my upbringing So I was brought up in a Christian family and I guess it was in junior high where a guy came and spoke at our church and um, started saying that, hey, there's some people out there that are going to tell you that Bi the Bible and science are in conflict and they cannot come together. And he said, but there is another way to look at it. And, and he showed some ways to kind of bring it together. And that sparked something in me, kind of the junior high age going into high school, where I'm like, hey, this is something I'm really interested in. And I started reading books and diving into apologetics resources and things. And, um, and it, was, it was a good thing because there was a, a, a spiritual development occurring. But the, the backside of that was like my freshman year in high school, uh, I argued with my biology teacher, which I don't recommend. Okay. Uh, and we, later I was able to, I think, make amends and repair that relationship uh, and ended up good. But, you know, in the moment, you really don't want to argue with your biology teacher. So, I, I give that background just to say I, I've I've looked at this differently as I've grown, and you know, as a as a junior high high school kid, for me it was like I'm I, I'm going to prove that this faith thing is real, that God is real, and that we can understand that. And so that set me on a trajectory for undergrad and grad school to say I want to get the degrees in science so that I can actually talk to people about this and say, look, you you can be a scientist and a person of faith. And if you look through history, um, just just go back in, in the history book or open up pretty much any science textbook and you start, you know, reading the names of the people that discovered some of the biggest things that are still underlying our understanding of science today. And they did it out of a place of faith, right? They said, we serve a God who created this universe in an orderly manner, and we ought to be able to study his creation in that way. And uh, it set them up to make huge discoveries that we still talk about and we still teach. And so, you know, just from a historical perspective, looking at science through that lens, I think uh, in particular, the Christian faith has enabled the advancement of science uh, far beyond a lot of others. Not to say that other religions can't or, or don't contribute to it or that people of no faith can't contribute to it. Uh, but I think where we saw it thrive is in a Christian environment, which is very interesting. Um, because, why do you think that is? Well, why, why the particular yeah. Christian environment? Why did that help? Well, again, I'm, I'm no historian, right? And there are books written about this. So there's a lot that could be said here. Um, but I think, again, it comes back to this idea that, okay, if God really did make all of this and God is not a God of confusion, um, then he created this to be understood. And he created us in a way for us to understand it and to explore. If you just think about the very fact that we can explore and understand and put things together and comprehend, like that's not necessarily a, a granted given thing in just every potential universe that could exist, right? So we talk a lot about the multiverse these days, right? That's very catchy. But there's a lot of potential universes where you couldn't, understand things the way we do. And so, I, you know, as I look at it, I think, okay, he created us in, in a place uniquely suited where things are discoverable for us. We're, we're the right size. We have the right kind of mind. We have eyes, we have ears, we have hands. We've got all these things where we can experience what's around us. And, you know, those, those aspects to me really say, okay, God created us to understand his creation. 
Now, why Christianity in particular, you know, as you think about it, I mean, as I think about what I read in God's word, the verse I go back to all the time is Romans 1 and verse 20. And that's this idea that since the beginning of the creation, he has, he has made things that we can understand and see his divine nature, his eternal power in the things that have been made. And um, so I think Christianity has built within it this idea that this, this universe is studyable, it's knowable, it's discoverable, um, and it's not a threat, right? We're, we're in, in a sense, we're going back to Genesis 1 and we're having dominion over the, the world, right? And we're trying to understand it and bring it into some uh, understanding. And I think that's what motivated a lot of Christians in years past to pursue some of these things. And, and even today, uh, you and I know Christians in science that are pursuing it for that reason, because we see it as part of God's calling. You know, as we look out here in nature, we see these trees and things like this, just to be able to understand them, how they work, how they spread, why they grow in some places and not in others, what animals can take shelter in them or grow in around them. Um, those things are all aspects of understanding the creation. Now, I admit, as not, you know, we have these broad terms. We talk about people being a biologist or whatever. I don't see myself as a biologist. To me, a biologist studies plants and animals, and I don't. What do you see yourself <laughs> so, as? So I study, I study biochemistry, so I see myself as a biochemist. But what does that really mean? That means I study the, the reactions taking place inside our cells and try to understand those reactions and how they work and how they relate to the overall metabolism of the cell or the functioning of the cell. And so, you know, I don't have as much of an appreciation as some of my colleagues for the ecology of what's going on outside this building. Uh, but I do look down at the biochemical level and think about, all right, what's happening in those leaves as they capture sunlight and try to convert that into energy that feeds this massive tree. Um, like those are the types of things I get excited about is studying that, that molecular level detail. And in particular, I study a really fun protein called topoisomerase. And its job is to untangle your DNA, but you didn't know you had tangled DNA, right? So you teach at a university. Yes. Right. You have this background that has led you to really understand at a fundamental and deep level what's going on in nature. Has that challenged your faith or helped your faith grow? Oh, great question. Um, uh, both. Um, the process of going through, uh, especially graduate school, was really trying on my faith uh, because in the field where I study and the, the types of uh, you know, teachers that I had at graduate school who were typically not people of faith, um, not all of them, but, but many of them were not people of faith, um, the constant message I heard was uh, that you evolved, uh, that all life evolved, that there is no design. Uh, I had one teacher openly mock uh, the idea that life was designed, openly mock the idea that enzymes were designed uh, because he had some particular pet enzyme example that he liked to call on that he thought was an example of bad design. And so uh, that was challenging. And every paper you read in the scientific literature uh, seems to indicate that we evolved, right? They use the same language. It's like, it's like they all got the same script and they all read from the same script and they write from the same script. Uh, and that was challenging uh, because, you know, on the one hand, I thought, OK, these people are really smart. They've learned a lot. This is the conclusion they've come to. Can I really stand up against that? Like, can I say anything back against that? Um, and so that was really, really challenging. But, but rather than being defeated by that, I said, I'm going to lean in because I want to understand more because there's something here. Uh, and what I kept coming back to, this enzyme that, that I study called topoisomerase 2, which I was studying in the lab at the same time going through all of this turmoil, I understood that enzyme is exactly what Romans 1 and verse 20 is talking about. It could not happen by accident. It could not happen on its own. It's required for life. So if you don't have it, you don't exist. And it just struck me, how could you have so many systems like this enzyme and others, others that are doing equally important functions? How could those things all pop into existence all at once? Like, where could they all come from? Um, and so I kept coming back to there has to be a bigger explanation. Um, the, the idea that uh, time, chance, random mutation, natural selection just creates all of the diversity that we see, let alone all of the, the functioning biochemical pathways, was very insufficient to me. I just was not very happy with that. 
there there are other ways to understand the evidence. In fact, several years ago, probably 10 years ago, I developed a little series for churches that I called Reinterpreting the Evidence. Because I wanted church people to know and to understand. They don't have to be scientists to understand that there are limitations to what scientists can say uh, confidently. Uh, and there are there are pieces of evidence out there that they're not being shown that maybe indicate that the story might not be as clear cut as as it seems. So, so it was both. A, I say it's been both a challenge, but also it's helped me grow a lot, and it's it's helped me recognize too that you know we don't have to know everything, and we're not going to know every answer. As a young person, I thought the goal was to know every answer and to just pummel your opponent into submission, right? Yeah. With the answers, and the reality is. We're not going to know all the answers, and I'm okay with that. That's just the way it is. Uh, but there's a lot of things we can understand and explain that make sense in light of a biblical, you know, worldview. Theos theory.